Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Caroline Hafey, and I'm the Assistant Director here at Glucksman Ireland House at NYU. It's my pleasure to welcome you all here this evening to celebrate 50 years of Ulysses Annotated. Um, if I could just ask everyone to silence any cell phones or devices at this time, we will be recording the, um, the event this evening. I'll take a minute, let everybody silence devices. <laughs> Um, and we will also be selling copies of the book uh, through NYU Bookstore just after. As well. Ha ha ha! Anybody who wants to, I'll sign. Those who don't have a copy already. <laughs> um, events like these are made possible through the generous support of our members. If you are interested in joining the membership community at Glucksman Ireland House, please see us afterwards, and we'd be happy to give you more information. So, for 50 years, Ulysses Annotated by Robert J. Seidman and Don Gifford has been an invaluable resource for anyone endeavoring to read or indeed teach Joyce's Ulysses. The volume acts as a guidebook for deciphering historical context, literary allusions, and gloss. This evening, Robert Seidman will be in conversation with Professor Vicki Mahafi uh, about the text and its legacy five decades later. Robert J. Seidman is a novelist, an Emmy-winning screenwriter, and a literary critic. With Don Gifford, he is the co-author of Ulysses Annotated, Notes from James Joyce's Ulysses, Seidman's film credits include Lush Life, Billy Strayhorn, a documentary that won the Writers Guild Award for Best Documentary Script, and a George Foster Peabody Award and an Emmy. He lives in New York City. Thank you. Thank you. Indeed. Uh, Professor Vicki Mahfi is the Clayton and Thelma Kirkpatrick Professor at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign in the English Department. She taught for 27 years at the University of Pennsylvania and held Chair of Modern Literature at the University of York in the UK for two years before moving to Illinois. She holds a PhD from Princeton and her forthcoming book, The Joyce of Everyday Life, will be published from Bucknell University Press this spring. So look out for that one. <laughs> Without further ado, I will turn it over to you all for a great conversation. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, Bob, um, I, I want to start by um, quoting something from a recent book by a woman named Sophie Courser on Ulysses. She says, openly and obliquely, Ulysses is referential from its title to its core. And then she goes on and does something very interesting to, to frame the importance of annotation. She says that when we read, um, and especially when you read Ulysses, you're constantly moving back and forth um, in the text, sometimes across hundreds of pages. Um, and sometimes you look up from the book, in fact, many times, <laughs> if you're not throwing <laughs> it against the wall, um, sometimes you look up from the book and you look inside at your own life. Um, but before you do that, you look outside at all of the references to things um, in 1904 Dublin that um, you do not know. And I'm, I'm saying that even if you're Irish, <laughs> there, there are things that one um, would not know that gets referenced in Ulysses. And this idea that Ulysses is unreadable without um, a way to access those external references. And um, Carolyn and I were just talking that I think, you know, Ulysses, that this book made it possible to read Ulysses um, for decades, especially before Google. Um, so anyway, I just I just wanted to hear your response. No, I, I, you know, the reason I got involved in this incredibly, you know, mind blowing, endless project, it's now been over 60 years since I first read this book in 1963, was that I asked the stupid question of our professor, Peter Hassinger, in the first row had him at Williams College. I said, it must be great, great fun to teach Ulysses. And Don said, you know what? I just teach the footnotes. It's no fun at all. All I do is a parade of erudition, and I can't talk about the book. And then he looked at me with this gleam in his eye, and he said, how about if we finish the job? And the result of this, this is a, excuse me, a second edition of the book. The first edition was in 1974 that Dutton produced. And the idea of the book, Vicky, it's, it's a great question, and thank you. The idea of the book was that it would grow with 
other people's contributions. And when we did the second edition in 88, uh, I, Don did most of the work. Actually, Don most did most of the work all the time. I was more like a gopher who went out and, uh, you know, found out about little factoids. Or, uh, and I did have some some you know, stylistic, I occasionally would suggest things to him. But um, <clears throat> we, the over, overwhelming number of details and the particularity, what is, is it Mies van der Rohe who said God is in the details? If you, you know, uh, Einstein. All right, anyhow. <laughs> Better. One of those great guys <laughs> said it. Uh, well, this is, you know, such a list of particulars and is so grounded in, as Vicky said, in Ireland, in the in the geography of that extraordinarily uh, embattled town, city, uh, and so filled with details of historical importance, of literary importance, of sexual importance, of yeah, you know, it's endless, which is why why Vicky's been at it for what twenty years. She's so young. <laughs> uh, and I've been at it for sixty years. it's it is it is inexhaustible. And I keep trying to resign from the post, you know, and say, all right, I've got to think about some other book someday. But every time I start to do that, I get another idea about something I should maybe write about. Right now, I'm trying to write about Eros and the body, not just about, sex but about the body and what Trish is so insistent upon throughout the entire book is that we have all these autonomic functions that we can't control things that are embarrassing to us things that disturb other people you know either by smell or or you know uh, and in any event uh, but the insistence on this gives us one of the fullest portraits of human life ever created in a literary context. This is really about what the body does and what the mind does and how the mind can travel, uh, you know, almost endlessly in its circuits. So did I answer, did I <laughs> answer any of that question? Uh, I'm not sure it was an answerable question. It was just, yeah. it was really about the process of reading in detail. Right. You know, what happens right. from moment to moment as you read and how important it is to be able to look outside um, at all of those details you mentioned in the world. Um, Flaubert said something like they're only interested, they're more interested in the annotations than they are in my text. And, <laughs> and, and Nabokov has an extraordinarily funny opening to, uh, to Pale Fire, which is basically, I have it here somewhere, but I don't want to look for it which is basically, before you start this poem, the sort of Robert Frostian poem that opens that fine novel, Pale Fire, he says, read, our, read my notes first, then read the poem, <laughs> then read the poem, and then read my notes again, in case you missed anything. So, I mean, this is so much fun, this kind of crazy digging in the turf. And there are always questions to be answered. They're just, you know, they keep, issues keep coming up. Uh, for instance, Mr. Deasy, Stephen's teacher, uh, headmaster at the school in the second chapter. By the way, he's not entirely gone from our lives. <laughs> not, and this is a kind of pathetic event because he lost most of his cane, but there, <laughs> there, there he is, too. Uh, in any event, um, Deasy, this is the, the essay I may want to write writes a letter to uh, the agricultural magazines. There are two in Dublin at the time, one of which is edited by A.E. or George Russell, you know, as, as you know. And uh, Stephen reads the letter in his head, but he only hits the cliches. He doesn't give you the sentence. And it's so brilliant tactically that Joyce doesn't want to bore us with, you know, this dumb cliched letter. So he just hits. And then Millie, their daughter, in the fourth chapter, when you meet uh, Leopold Bloom and Molly, ends her note by saying, please excuse the bad writing in a hurry. So I'm going to look for all these examples of bad, bad, bad writing, I, I think. <laughs> Should we go on? <laughs> <laughs> if you like. Um, well, I think what I, what I was wondering is when you were so young yeah. and chasing down these details, right. um, how did it affect you? 
in other words, how did it, um, did it develop a certain eye for the particular, mm -hmm. um, for the real um, that you've never lost? Is it affected your films? Um, I, I don't know, but it's certainly the right question to ask. Uh, I think because Joyce layers that work so exquisitely and so heavily, I, I, I think that uh, I feel like I'm an amateur in almost everything I do. That is, uh, you know, particularly in writing, writing novels are different things because you really do get to know the people and the context, blah, blah, blah. But writing film is, is a wonderful thing to do. First of all, it's collaborative. So I'm not just sitting there by myself all day long, as my son Peter knows, you know, from years of suffering under his father. I'm sorry, Peter, I'm busy. I gotta finish this. <laughs> um, so it's done in the community. And that's exactly what I, I need when I'm, I, I always keep two projects going, one a novel and one a film if I can. Uh, and so let's see. How does he affect me? Well, I write about in the novels. I write a lot, a lot about sex, so maybe you know. And that's and the new novel, which is about a character who worked for Joseph Pulitzer. The last documentary film I did is about Joseph Pulitzer, and there was a great star female reporter whose real name was Elizabeth with an E. Anyhow, I can't remember her last name, but her, her pen name. Cochran, thank you, Wynn, Lynn, um, with an, without any, without any, Cochran without any. And her pen name was Nellie Bly, N-E-L-L-I-E-B-L-Y. Nellie Bly was this egregiously awful song by Stephen Foster. It's one of the most racist songs imaginable. They picked it, Pulitzer and his managing editor, who was an Irishman called John Cochran, they picked it because it was a very popular song at the time. So it immediately gave her a high profile, even though no one knew who she was at the time. So um, where, where do we start with it? Um, so, oh, particulars. Yeah, particulars, the real, the real, the fact that you do documentaries and even when you do fiction, it's got a real um, basis in fact. Yeah, I mean, certainly the historical fiction does. And you, you, you can't win the historical fiction game ever because the people who knew the last novel was about Muybridge, the, the, the photographer who developed the motion picture cam uh, projector. Uh, and I was thinking of calling him Arthur Dixon. So the, the one of the passwords is Dixon's picks on my computer. But after a long discussion with my agent and with my publisher, we decided to use Moybert. So everybody was angry at me for not not doing the real Moybert to doing the fictional. But if I if I had named him Arthur Dixon, they would have complained about it being Wibbert. So you can't, you, in this game, you cannot win. It's simple. As that. But as people read it, it's fun. I would, I'm thinking just one thing about, about the text, Vicky, which I don't know will come up. When I was living in Paris in 1965, how's that for a good line, right? <laughs> Do I like saying that? When I was living there, um, I met an Irish guy considerably older than I was. And we were in a bar. A, 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 a bar that was pretending to be an Irish pub, but they did have Guinness on tap, so it's kind of legit. And anyhow, and I was, I maybe had a couple of Guinnesses, and I was feeling pretty, you know, uh, snappy at 24. And I said to Kevin, Kevin, you must love, love reading Ulysses. I get in trouble whenever I say the word Ulysses. And he spit out, he honestly spit out this big, massive, of Guinness on the on the bar, and he turned to me enraged, and he said, "I can't stand the effing book." And I said, "I, I don't know. It's I, to me, it's one of the greatest things I've ever written." He said, "You don't get it, kid. Every time I pick up a page, I feel like I'm back in Dublin, and, <laughs> and I've left Dublin for the reason that Sam Beckett left it and James Joyce left." It. So realism. Forget about the meta text, even though you can do all that stuff and it'll work. It's so real to people. Who were there, and this goes back to Vicky's point about the particulars. The buildup of the particulars is so overwhelmingly accurate at times. Sometimes it's inaccurate. That's the other thing. So, is annotation worth it? Do you do you, does it change the nature of reading reading experience? One, when we did it, no one knew what the book was. There was no information. A couple of scholars had pieces of this stuff. Alison, you knew several of them. Um, 
but not everybody had, no one had really put it together. So we put it together and we found two geographical jokes in the, in the, in the novel. Uh, Stephen relocates the archbishop, the, uh, the archbishop's palace in the old physics theater of the university or, or one of the colleges. So, you know, science has been replaced by faith in that model. How's that for clever? Uh, it's a little like, uh, anyhow. Uh, and the other one was that Bloom has been fired from a job at the stationers and the stationers name, how's this for a stationer? is Wisdom Healy. I think it's the greatest name in the world. And Bloom thinks of Wisdom Healy's address both times he puts him in the Liffey or in the Tolka. He wheels him out of existence. So that's the kind of funny particularity that he has. Also song lyrics. There are 256 references to songs in Ulysses, all of which I researched, or many of which I researched at the Lincoln Center uh, Library of the Performing Arts because they had sheet music. So anything with lyrics, Gifford said to Seidman, check out, the way we'll do this is the first uh, verse, the chorus, and then if there's any kicker in the song, you know, we'll throw that into the mix. And so I'm there dutifully going through all the sheet music and I'm thinking every Dubliner who read it and maybe some English people who read it in 1920s into the 30s would have had a soundtrack in her or his head. What does that mean? I mean, imagine that. Actually, it's like a musical, you know, it's, and, and it's from, it's also his great breakdown of high culture, low culture. <laughs> Not here. They're all moshed together. They all, you know, inter interact with each other. When you take this book and look at the songs, I, I just find it's still a kick uh, after uh, 50 years. You just go down and see all these names of all the songs and the saints and all the quotations from Shakespeare. So it, it, it's just such a guess. And what, what fun, what fun he must have had. You know, there must have been a point. Look, this, any writer knows or any artist knows it's no fun what we do. It really isn't fun. But there is a point sometimes when you think, hmm, this isn't bad. This is kind of exciting. Anyhow, so do annotations change your reading of it? A little bit, a tiny bit. But cumulatively, you also have to know what world you're in. You really have to know what world you're in. And this, this, you know, and now there's a new annotation. They've done a wonderful job. I'm very impressed by their scholarly work. They make, from my point of view, a couple of, a few mistakes. One is it's twice this big because they have a beautiful format. It's laid up. It's very expensive. I think it's 160 bucks now. Um, whatever this costs, 30 bucks, I think. But we double columned it. So we cut it in half, basically. And uh, they do very little with the apparatus of the Odyssey, which I think, is, and Vicky thinks is a real mistake, because even though Joyce is selective about this, the, his use of the Odyssey, it's one of, the one of the strongest structural apparatus that wraps itself around. And it's also a story, the same story. It's a, a guy who, away from home, Mr. Bloom walks 8.9 miles on June 16th. Eight, but that's a lot. I walk four or five every day. That's a lot of miles. Of course, his job is, is he's at canvases, so we, that's part of his job. Um, uh, anyhow, we're worried this year. Oh, well, me out. <laughs> let, let, let's just go back to realism for a minute, because one of the very first things I learned about Joyce was that um, when he was in Trieste, he gave a lecture on William Defoe and a lecture on William uh, on William Blake. Daniel Defoe and William Blake. You see what I just did? <laughs> I do know the difference. Yeah. <laughs> Barely. <laughs> but but anyway, and um, th the idea that he integrates the realism with, um, you know, something more spiritual uh, may make that not a joke, you know. Yeah. That... <laughs> no, I think that, and also Molly is named, you know, she, she dislikes Ma Flanders. She don't like the, right. the I love I think. The, yeah. the quality of the joking is, it's a very, fun, I mean, I assume most people here have read in it or read it or really are devotees, but for those few that haven't read it, yes, it's hard. Yes, there is possible at times, but it is really, really funny. Vicki and I were talking today. We had 
T uh, just before we 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 got to this lovely locale, and um, oh shoot, I've just lost it again. This happens when you're 82, right? I had a thought there. There was a thought there. Okay. Oh, funny. Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry. Thank you very much. Um, Stephen is teaching a class in a kind of uh, you know a, a rather fancy private school. And he tells a joke, which which I think is very funny. But he tells a joke to these disaffected young people, probably what, 14, 13, 14, something like that. Anyhow, not quite clear. And he says, a bridge, a, a, a pier is a disappointed bridge. And none of the kids get it. It's like, <laughs> you know that feeling when you tell a joke? <laughs> I mean, this is such a human book. He had the wrong audience. You guys would laugh. We, you know, we could get a laugh. Not, not a bunch of disaffected teenagers. We weren't even called teenagers then. What were they called in 1904? You know, between the ages of 10. Anyhow, anyhow let, let, let's go on. Well, that, this um, gets back to something else we were just talking about, which is that Ulysses is a book for adults. And one of the bad parts about teaching it to um, college students <laughs> is um, that they they don't really have the life experience to be able to um, to enjoy it. And by the time you can enjoy it, you're not reading anymore. <laughs> you know, so that's too bad. <laughs> but um, that that adult um, pitch, yeah. I think, is is really important. Um, and. Uh, it let's go back to sex because I know that's your interest right now. <laughs> right. Right. Um, you know, and the body. Um, I, uh, I, I, part of what makes Joyce's interest in the body and in all the bodily functions so um, amazing is how offensive it was. Yes, and how it the offense of talking realistically about the body was like naming the Wellington Monument. You know, yeah. um, the it's the relationship between right. the realism of the place yeah. and um, the facts of the body, right. which still offend people. Um, you know, so that's when you when I teach it, the students are less offended by the sex than they are about the defecation. Yeah, um, yeah. There are two acts of defecation in the book, which both of which I love. First of all, Bloom is he's a thirty-eight-year-old man. He's actually in pretty good shape. He's 5'9 and weighs 158 pounds. So he, he's not fat, I don't think. I mean, 5'9 and 158. In any event, he has to think about how to take a dump because he's had hemorrhoids. So there's the whole strategy about how he approaches this thing, <laughs> easing it out. You know, excuse me, I don't want to be too graphic, but, <laughs> but, but I mean, imagine, it's again, a joy of joys. Imagine him writing that scene thinking, Boy, is this going to piss them off, excuse me for the bad part. And then, that's funny enough, and, and true, and real, real. When was the last dump in English literature? Virginia Woolf, as good as she is, couldn't take it. This is the outpourings of a working class mind, you know. How dare he encroach on this ground? Now, the book is all about breaking down the high-low distinctions, among many, many other things. And he and he loves high art. I mean, he loves, you know, great music and great literature. Um, anyhow, the other defecation. It, it, it's, <laughs> Wait, can I say it. something about, about Wolf before of we course. move on? Don't forget the other defecation. No, please. please. Um, go, but go, go. she also said that a woman couldn't get away with um, publishing, that no one would publish it if she... Uh, wrote about the kinds of right. things that Joyce right. wrote about. So she was right about that, I think. That's but true. go ahead, other defecation. Yeah, no, absolutely. But the other one is, is I don't know which one I love more. I love both of them. <laughs> Bloom, is walking, Bloom is walking along the Liffey, and he's in, he's in mourning clothes because he's going to a funeral of someone he doesn't know well, but actually kicks in five shillings, which is not an insubstantial amount to the, to the plate, to the, you know. And he helps to work out this very entangled life insurance policy that this guy who was a drunkard and falls down and dies of apoplexy probably. Um, anyhow, he's walking along the bliffy and, and this is so cinematic, Ed. He's, um, he, he looks up and he sees some pigeons over, overhead and he says, point of view pigeon, who will we do it on? Uh, they're, they're, no, they're, they're, morning, they're morning frolic. Who are we doing on? I picked the gentleman in, in black. 
<laughs> Here goes. And then the line, which is when you just think of Bloom straining in the outhouse, must be thrilling from the air. <laughs> I mean, uh, what more could you ask for? Is that is that Saturday Night Love? I mean, it's just it's wonderful humor. It is so funny, and you get the cinematic point of view switch. You know, you go from from him to the to the birds in the air, the pigeons in the air. We're trying to animate. Actually, Willie, you're here. Willie Willie Hartland is a wonderful guy, and it's and we're trying to. This is fundraising, but not seriously. We're trying to make a film about, a documentary film about my involvement in uh, Ulysses and the book. It's really about the book, but Willie has just done some beautiful animation of the scene that I have just described. <laughs> so, the pigeon scene. Anyhow, yeah. Anyhow. Vicky, what else you were talking about? <laughs> well, you all were talking about the um, James Joyce Society's 18 chapters of Ulysses yeah. and how much everyone yeah. enjoyed it. Yeah. You know, since you're working um, with animators and since you make films, something I've always wanted to see is um, a limited series of Ulysses um, with animation yeah. for the parts, you know, that can't um, be realistically rendered. Um, anyway, I don't know. I have the guy. I have the guy. Yeah, okay. Well, <laughs> we should talk about that. Um, but the, the, I, I think I wanted to go somewhere else, which is what do yeah. you think of the way that um, Joyce can depict not only real things and places and um, feces and et cetera, but um, what do you think about the way that he can make you aware of what the readers themselves don't know? Would you talk about this because you bet you re I just read part most of Vicky's new book, which is marvelous, and it deals with exactly just a little pricey because you were really you, you you've just done such a beautiful job with that that well, question. Thank you. You're welcome. Please. Um. Well, it's it's um, I I think you mentioned one of the places, which is um that when Bloom sees Boylan, um he um says heart. He said he says my, my heart, heart my heart my heart um and that. Vicky, can I just set it up a little bit? Please. Bloom is walking toward the National Museum. The National Library and the National Museum are right next to each other. He wants to see, body, if Venus Calibia guy, Venus of the shapely buttocks, has an anus. That's his question. <laughs> He's asked himself that. And as he approaches the building, he sees the rival who's going to visit Molly in a couple of hours and, and have an assignation with him. And he begins to run. Now, Bloom hasn't run, I think, in a long time. Yeah. Um, well, um, he also, when he sees Boylan, says, not or thinks, not see, not see. Um, and the um, way in which the text disguises some of this, because I'm not sure Boylan is named at that point. He's identified by his um, socks and um, his hat. You know, so that if you're paying attention to what he's wearing, you know, you know that Bloom actually just catches a glimpse of his clothes and then blinds himself. And then you run into a, a blind stripling, you know, that, <laughs> you know, Bloom helps across the street. So the way in which we're being positioned to show what Bloom is blinding himself to um, is very intricate. And um, Joyce does this better than, well, any other writer I've ever read. Um, this, this, um, and and it's a a privilege, I think, to be able to look into the unconscious minds of literary characters. I would love to be able to look into the unconscious minds of people I know. You know? <laughs> so maybe this is just compensation. But um, you know, <laughs> the technique that allows that um, to happen, uh, I think, the it's mobility, incredible. the speed of which this happens, and and the line that he does say in his head, "My heart," which of course is breaking as he's thinking about it. it's so touching without being corny and it's actually physiologically possibly he's a 38 year old man has not run for a long time the other heart is there are these motifs i have 10 11 12 of them now these beautiful little single lines that run through the book but the the other heart line is the heart the line that goes his father rudolph who was an orthodox jew 
commits suicide. He marries an Irish woman, and and uh, we know very little about it. I've been thinking about the mothers that we know nothing about. Molly's mother, we know almost nothing, maybe even less about Bloom's mother, who is not Jewish. Uh, but Molly's uh, mother is. Yeah, we think. I mean, yeah. I, I'm not certain, but it, it certainly looks like it could be. In any event, um, he has a thought in the funeral scene. He's in a hearse, and they're going toward uh, the Catholic Glasnevin Cemetery. And he, uh, one guy in the uh, in the in the hearse, this four man hearse, four seat hearse, says something about suicides and how dreadful it is. It's the worst act of anyone could do and bloom thinks uh used to drive a stake through his heart but it's already broken of his father i mean they're just these things that are so potent and so simple and you said you said that bloom helps this blind stripling piano tuner across a very busy intersection and we are going to open the documentary with me doing this and and uh, Will's, Bill's son helping him across the street. Um, queer, the line is, in Bloom's head, after he's led this lad to safety, queer idea of Dublin he must have, tapping his way round by the stones. And I believe he's talking about all of us. I don't think this is about a blind kid. Although it is about a blind, I think it's about all of us. We have no idea what's going to happen next. We're all blind. And this is the universality of the particular. It's a remarkable, you know, and, and Vicky's been on this beautifully in this. It, it, it somehow enlarges, <laughs> enlarges your vision of, 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 you know, of yourself and of, your, and of, your, of the folks that you're intimate with and friendly with. Um, I want to talk about, because you're really wonderful about what what is this book really about what is it really you mean about? ulysses yeah um well um or do you want to talk about something before we get there? we're going to have a, a a slight difference of opinion oh, because oh, um oh. i already know what you said but you I, think it's about yeah, right. and I, I think that's um a wonderful thing and i i will give you a chance to say it in just a minute no go ahead. <laughs> and i'm not going to out you on it <laughs> um <laughs> but for me um the book is is kind of always about um, what you just said right. about the blindness of the reader, and um, the thing that makes it extraordinary is all of the multitude of invitations, multitudes of invitations that the readers get to see more, to hear more, mm. um, you know, to wonder more, um, and that over time it's made me realize how um, many filters. Uh, get accrued over a lifetime where you don't really see, hear, or wonder anymore. Hmm. And um, so, uh, and it's totally voluntary. There's really nothing in the book that would make you feel compelled to do what the book rewards. You don't even know it is going to reward it. Um, but if you have um, an on ongoing acquaintance with it, then you begin to understand. <laughs> I remember um, uh, I, I once got angry at something that Jonathan Franzen had written in a review against difficult books. And, um, you know, I uh, it, it made me realize that Ulysses is not a one night stand. You know, <laughs> most <laughs> most books are one night stands. <laughs> Ulysses is not. It's an ongoing engagement that gives you the opportunity to kind of reopen the pores of sensation and curiosity. And one example of this is when I was in Dublin last, I just um, I went on a tour of Glasnevin Cemetery and I was so fascinated by all of the things I learned and how they opened up parts of Ulysses that um, I hadn't ever really wondered about before. You know, would I have ever gone on a tour of a cemetery um, in a in another country, <laughs> you know, um, instead of a pub crawl or, or whatever, you know, if it hadn't been for Ulysses? So that that question of what makes people want to know is something that I, as an educator, have really been invested in, because unless they want to know, you, you ain't teaching them. Um, and Ulysses do doesn't make most people want to know. <laughs> that's, that's the bad part. But if you do want to know, 
um, it makes you realize that um, the kinds of things you're curious about become um, begin to exponentially grow, like um, how does my water get from the reservoir to my tap? <laughs> you know, that's, that's one example, you know, if that's something I never would have wondered about um, in all of the world. We so. don't disagree <laughs> about this at all. I, I'm, I'm thinking sort of in terms of plot rather than the beautiful overview of this plot. Let me just say one thing about the water, because Vicki and I were talking about, <laughs> it's an incredible thing. It's in this penultimate chapter, in the 17th chapter, which is set up catechistically or question and answer like and bloom has gone to his sink to give his visitor Stephen Dedalus a cup of cocoa and himself and he the question is did it flow and bloom turns on the tap and Joyce starts out there somewhere and takes the water down from its first reservoir to a, a reservoir called still organ talk about male problem, and then down into Dublin. And I was working on a film with a wonderful man called Raymond Silver, two-hour film about the Catskill, and I thought, theft, grand <laughs> larceny. And we we didn't make the film, unfortunately. Ray got killed in a, steer, in a skiing accident, a wonderful guy. In fact, this is, I mean, just to give you an idea what a gentleman this guy was, married to Joan Micklin Silver, the fine filmmaker and uh, very, very lovely people. We had a really nice conversation about the com about the Catskills and what we might do in this in this film. And he said to me, the Writers Guild, as Ed knows well, has a fee structure. And he said, what, what is it going to cost? I said, I don't know, 30 grand, 35 or something. It was a long time ago. And he wrote a check for the entire amount. And I tell you, I was in shock. That has never, ever happened. We had one conversation. He thought I was the guy for the job. And he wasn't going to mess around with this crap. He really wasn't. He just said, you know, whatever it is, I signed a check. I like, I walked out stunned. I don't, I think my mother and I went someplace and had a really good meal. But, <laughs> uh, um, 19, we started this thing in 1966. We got there, I'm thinking about timing because of the new annotation, um, and it's 50 years old, as you know, if we said 400 done. Uh, we fortunately, it was very fortunate we started when we did, because some of the characters were still alive. I interviewed the columns, not very well. I don't remember much about the interview, but they were very gracious. And he isn't treated all that well. You know, the, the, the poem is... Does it have genius and wild earth, the Grecian vase and boss and anyhow. Um, I got in touch almost immediately with the great linguist who wrote the the Oxford book of slang and unconventional English. His name is was Eric Partridge, which is a great name for a language guy. And he knew more about the ephemera of slang than anyone else in the world, in English. So I wrote to him and he basically quite hopefully wrote back and said, who the hell are you? And then I we explained and then he sent those wonderful blue airmail letters with Elizabeth II's up in the corner and this very spidery hand. Yes, Mr. Seidman, uh, lag means arrested and transported in Australia, you know, that kind of stuff, just wonderful thing. And then we bought a book, which was called Name Your Child on the on the spine and then it said Eric Partridge so we thought we had to name Peter Eric Partridge but we didn't <laughs> decided that was not a good <laughs> anyhow so imagine this happening when I was living in Paris in 1965 <laughs> I meet a guy and I like him a lot he's an older man it seemed to me he was in his 80s I was 25 he was 68 uh, I am now 82 he was a big florid man and a painter, and he painted these beautiful color wheels, abstract color wheels. And he had a beautiful studio in, uh, in Alicia on the 14th down there. And uh, we did a lot of drinking together. And one night I was at his place, and he said, did I ever tell you the story about meeting Joyce and making drawings of her? No, Hilaire. Hilaire Heiler is the gentleman's name. He also did a very nice mural in San Francisco at the aquarium or one of the WPA things. And he was the, the guy who decorated the jockey club that Hemingway said was the greatest 
club ever in the world. Anyhow, <laughs> he was a character. Um, but he was he had a bronchial a pulmonary problem, and he would start to cough, and he would cough and cough and cough. And I thought, you know, I'm 25. I thought, this guy's going to die while he's coughing. So we're at his place, and um, he, he, he's coughed once. And he tells me he's just, he's got three drawings. He was walking down the street with a guy called Robert McCallman, who was one of the, you know, literary types of the period. And some guy ran up to them and said, Joyce wants to talk to an Irish Jew. Now, McCallman was American, but Scots and descent, and Hilaire was Jewish, but he was not an Irish Jew. In any event, McCallman and Hilaire, like, Peter, you've heard this story before, but uh, they go to Joyce's home and they drink white wine all afternoon. All afternoon, Joyce does not like red wine. It's some kind of odd remark about it. it tastes like meat or something. Like that. Do you remember what it was? <laughs> no, I only remember what the white wine yeah. <laughs> resembles. Anyhow, so. anyhow Hilaire says, uh, I did three drawings of him um, that day. Uh, they're upstairs. I'll go up and get one. And and then he started to cough, and I, I really literally thought he would you just pass it around uh, if you wish. Anyhow, I found it online. I found it online. It's a 1934 drawing of him. It's a wonderful drawing, and I'm such an idiot for not saying, God, old man, go up those stairs and get it. <laughs> but I, I, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. Um, <laughs> So anyhow, meeting someone who actually knew Joyce and had spent time with him, we, we were very lucky about the, about the timing of this thing. Well, I um, turned off my cell phone, so I have no idea what time it is, but I want you to get to what you think the book is about. Okay. <laughs> so. Well, I think I agree with you, but I also agree with me. I think <laughs> it's in plot terms, in narrative terms, it's about whether that marriage will survive or not. Uh, whether Bloom, Leopold, and Molly have enough showing for them to overcome 10 years, five months, and eight days of not having intercourse. They do have sort of some messing around, and he comes on a tushy at some point, fairly recently, we think. But um, they haven't had intercourse because I believe that Leopold Bloom is applying Orthodox Jewish attitudes toward his sexuality that and i've done some research and i've written uh, something about this the orthodox jews believe and i'm jewish just so i'm not talking you know too much out of school although i'm, I'm an atheist and have been for a long time uh my father's father was an orthodox jew and he wouldn't tear uh, toilet paper on shabbos his wife would have to tear this this is you know one of the nazi prohibitions uh, that, and I think Joyce is such an opponent of this kind of nonsense uh, belief that makes no sense whatsoever. In any event, to be a successful male, you have to produce both a male child and a female child. That's part. That's what you must do. I think Bloom is torturing himself about something really, really wrong and wrongheaded. And I think that Molly and Bloom might be capable of having the conversation that they've avoided for over a decade. I think it's possible. I'm not sentimentalizing this, I don't think, but they are so obsessed with each other. There's an incredible play with, with the pronoun he in her monologue. It's like an hyperactive, hyperkinetic ping pong ball. It goes back and forth between the lover and the husband, the lover and the husband. But if you if you do the quantitative thing, if you do the Carolyn Sturgeon thing, it's more about Bloom than it is about Boylan. Because of course, Bloom has been with her for so long. They've been married for 15 years. They share so many thoughts. They share, they, they disagree about a lot of stuff, but they, they are so much in each other's head. And, and Boylan is a very successful athletic lover, but he is not, He's never going to write her the letter that she's pining for. And of course, who wrote her the letters before? Leopold. He's, he's, he's trying he, to look like Lord Byron. I'm sorry. <laughs> when he looked like Lord Byron. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, so I, I hold out this, you know, very romantic hope that, that they might get together. But of course, this is the book is over. We're not going to ever get a sequel to this book. So um, 
I don't know, Boylan, you know, of course, slaps her on the ass and, and she thinks, I'm not a horse or an ass, am I? <laughs> you yeah. know, so obviously she, and she thinks um, he doesn't have any more poetry in him than a cabbage. Yeah. Um, so uh, these are not good, good things. Um, but she's also looking forward to their date on Monday. Yeah. And they may go on tour together. Bloom has been her manager of her. She's a singer. She's a soprano and apparently quite good. There's a wonderful moment. This is another one of these little gems where Molly is singing in a church and her then manager, Leopold Bloom, her husband says, pitch, pitch your voice into that corner. And then it comes back on the crowd. It comes, it's just pitch your voice. Anyhow, it's, it's so much fun. I, I do want to just do one quick thing here, um, which is just to give you, we're running out of time. Is that correct? Yeah, okay. Um, these are just my little, you know, gems that I think of as skewers, unless you have something you want to cover. Nope. But okay. Queer idea of Dublin must have. Uh, we, we already talked about that. One of them is good puzzle. Boom thinks of this in the first time you meet him. Good puzzle would be to cross Dublin without passing a pub. There's a huge problem in the book. All the males are drunk with almost without exception. Alcohol is a huge problem. And Simon Dedalus, Stephen's father, is not that far removed, although Joyce never does simple biography from Joyce's father, who was a drunkard and a wastrel, and managed to make them move from a very secure economic position to a considerably more troubled. This is a very complicated one. And I'll only try to do a little gloss on it. Bloom visits a pork butcher in the first in the fourth chapter, the first time we meet him. He loves he relish of inner he, he eats with relish the organs of inner of, of beasts. Uh, and he likes the the uh, scent of urine in the kidney. you know, and there's uh, there's considerable amount of oral sex in his thinking and in her thinking. Um, and he says, as he enters the butcher's, after he looks at a throwaway sheet of paper, which is advertising for uh, you to buy a portion of a crop from Palestine. That's why I say it's complicated. Um, and the sheet is printed badly. It's not clear, it's clear to me whether it's bad printing or a kind of messy view of Palestine. Zionism starts in the 1890s. This guy, the pork butcher in Dublin, Ireland, thought he was is Jewish because there are no Jews in, in Dublin. You have a handful of Jews in Dublin. You can't make a living as a kosher butcher. And so I thought he was, Bloom. And while Bloom's in line waiting to get his kidney, his scented with slightly with urine his kidney, uh, he sees the young maid of all work who works next door and he loves seeing her bang the carpet because her skirt swings and he sees her leg. And he thinks, I, I want to pay my money quickly and follow her and walk behind her moving hams, which of course is not kosher. <laughs> Anyhow, it's, 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 so, it's, so, it's so much fun. My heart, they used to drive a stake of wood through his heart in the grave as if it wasn't broken already. Their little frog after lunch, Oh, the one, this is a great one too. Um, a man of inflexible honor down to his fingertip. You know, this is the masturbation scene. And uh, uh, Vicky's a great hawk about self deception in this novel. It's really, really magnificently balanced about people's positive impulses and their lying and their lies to themselves. <laughs> and sometimes those, those things get intermeshed, of course, too. Um, and Bloom is masturbating to her Bloomer show, and he's a man of inflexible honor down to his fingertips. Um, did it flow? We talked about it. And this is the one that really kills me. This also is buttresses my feeling about the importance of the marriage to me. Uh, uh, Molly Bloom has a book that she's once returned to a lending library. And Leopold is the guy who goes outside. Leopold does his 8.9 miles and Molly never moves from 7 Apple Street. She's just there like Penelope. And the honesty would just make me crazy that Sloat and Gang didn't want to keep it in. Anyhow, um, um, 
Molly asked Bloom to take the book back to the library. The book is called Sweets of Sin. It's not a very good book, uh, but it's, it, is that the one by Paul Dukas? Or is it the other one? Anyhow, the one point, there's a, a, the pseudonym of a writer is Paul Dukas, and Molly says, nice name he has, which I love. But Molly asked a very apposite question to Leopold, which is to buttress my argument. And she says, as she hands him the book, is she in love with the first fellow all the time? And Bloom says, don't know. Do you want another? <laughs> yeah. Anyhow. Well, I just have to say, I've read a book of Paul de Cox. I may be the only one. <laughs> I know? have it. I have it. I just got it, actually. Yeah. Because no, I was actually, reading it. Nothing book. smutty in it. I no. I'm just saying. No. He may have a nice name, but anyway, yeah. very prol prolific guy. Yeah. I don't know if you have run across him in the... <laughs> 19th century. That's why I asked. I know it's 19th century French, but um, all right. Well, we are very interested in having and hearing from you. So, did you get to spend a lot of time in Dublin, Rob? Not that much. I went in '69 and did a, a research tour for our book. It was one. I had a great time. I really had a great time. They didn't send you off to research this. You mean? Yeah, this was the second edition. Whoop, ah! Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> Good catch. Um, it, it, I didn't go back for that. I went back later, but forget it. You've seen it before. <laughs> um, but I, there was a line in the, in the in the Hades chapter, reigns on their sleeve like the statues in Glasnevin. And I went... Actually, this is a confession. A friend of mine didn't give me a tab of mescal, and this is 1969. So I was tripping in in the cemetery. So it probably was a wasted, <laughs> not like you actually yeah, knew what was going on. <laughs> wasted. I, I never I didn't take much mescal in my life, but it happened, you know, there it was, and it was very cold. I was freezing. But I did stop in that pub, uh, the Great. grave, that's the one. And I said to the guy, the mescal was just coming on, I said to the guy, he said, the gentleman who owned the pub, and it's a family pub, it's been in the family for four or five generations, he said, uh, somebody was just shooting in here the other day, film crew came in, and I said, oh yeah? And I was thinking, I thought, did they ever get anything wrong? And he laughed, he, like this demonic laugh. And he said, yeah, you know what they don't know? There's something called the old man in the cellar. They take half drunk, uh, half finished glasses of say Guinness, put them in the drain. It goes downstairs, and then, then the pre, you know, sanitation guys and girl. There it was. You know, you drank your neighbor's uh, rejected booze. But I know, I know. It's not sanitary, but it's you know, 1904 Dublin. You know. Old man in the cellar. Uh, Allison. Um, is it about only Ulysses characters or is it about more? Um, well, it's also about how readers fool themselves. I mean, essentially, it's about the difference between conditioned reading, which is the reading we all learn to do, how we learn to interpret. Um, and in order to interpret, you learn to screen out things that would mess with that interpretation versus um, a, a sort of deconditioned mode of reading, which is what Ulysses. Um... <laughs> no, I'm not. Yeah. I did my dissertation here on Bart. And that's that. And how his techniques would be applied to. He does that all the time.
Yeah, no, I think. Well, so, yeah, yeah. teach Irish history in the U.S., as you know. So that's one of the problems. I mean, I've had a student at Penn come up to me and say, excuse me, is Ireland divided? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I know. We could, we could do this all day. <laughs> wow, that's a big question. Um, um, well, no, I love I love teaching Ulysses, um, but it, it's it, it's like um, a time delay thing. In, in other words, what I tend to do is to do something knowing that um, when it hits them, I won't get to see it. Um, but mm. I have had people contact me 20, 30, 40 years later, <laughs> you know, that's a lot of time yeah. and say, I, I didn't realize. And I think you hit the reason it's it's the lack of emotional development that makes it hard and and you can't read Ulysses without a lot of heart that's right. and, you, and as I think Ellen said you don't read Ulysses you only read it <laughs> that's because right what choice gives us is the echoes of Adam that may be a hundred pages apart but it can just be that yeah we well, one of the one of the great oh yeah that's yeah. like what happened before one of the great that's things right. Allison one of the great things is that that time bomb that delay that payoff it's yeah. really wonderful i don't know another writer who that, does that you get in the book it's, in book, but it's it, in well yeah. of course um very early i can't remember the chapter bloom runs into um josie green powell who we had a little affair with i don't know you know what happened but they certainly green. were in, they were green yeah green now uh, and they certainly were involved with each other. And Molly gets the last word on that. Uh, Josie says to Bloom, she eyes him, and he he says, enough of that. No. And, and you know, there's just a little tease, and you're wondering what it's about. And then in Molly's chapter, in her monologue, she answers the question. So it's, you know, probably 400 pages later. And she says to herself, um, I was I was combing my hair, and I would make her mouth water, just giving her some vague idea of what went on with us. It grigged her to her to this tease. It's so amazing that four hundred pages roughly later, you get the payoff to the, and it happens several times in the book. That's what Troy said. I said my book is unreadable, but if Ulysses. Is unreadable, then life is unreadable. Oh, life is unreadable. <laughs> that's that's queer <laughs> idea he must have of that one. I mean, Joyce is not Allison, he's not an oversimplifier ever, yeah. ever. It's not an oversimplifier ever. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, you know, we're in, we, we agree about it. Allison, I just wanted to say that, um, I, I just did read a good book, um, that applies Roland Bart to. Um, Ulysses, and it's the one I mentioned at the very beginning by Sophie Corser called The Reader's Choice. I'm sorry, gentlemen. 
Yeah, hi, it's John Waters, I'm a faculty member here. Um, that was just terrific. Uh, Robert, I have two questions uh, for you. Yes. One you don't have to answer, um, it's not really a question, it's more just a curiosity as to why you feel compelled to exaggerate your age so much. Um, the second 82. though- 82 is, well, my son, Peter is 41. I just thought of this double. And there was a point at which I was, I was triple your age. Remember when we discussed that? I'm uh, sorry. I, I was 41 when my son was born, so I'll hope, uh, okay. I'll hope to get there. Yeah. But uh, second question, though, I, I was, I managed to uh, first study Ulysses with Kenner um, uh -huh. in the 80s. And one, one question goes straight to your reading of the book right? Um, that, that you and, and uh, Professor Mahaffey just got to, and it has to do with uh, the question of reconciliation, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, the question what was posed to Hugh Kenner was um, the very first line of, uh, of Molly's soliloquy or Molly's chapter is, he'd never done a thing like that, asked me to make him breakfast in bed. Yeah. And, yeah. and I don't know where else, but in Baltimore in 1985, breakfast in bed was, was morning sex. Yeah. Of course. And so, yeah. I just, so I just wonder if you, if that, you know, it's not glossy. I think it's a great else. insight. I, when you said it, you, I hadn't thought of it until you said, it, I thought breakfast in bed, it doesn't just mean, you know, bringing him toast and tea. I've always thought yeah. I've always thought that it that it yeah. uh, that given Bloom's kiss of reconciliation, right, uh, as it were, in the marriage bed, that we can't really think we we have to think that he's come home with more desire for his wife, not less. I, I think that's hopeful, and I hope that's true. I, I you know I, I would love to believe that. I'm not sure I do totally believe it, but I like the idea of it. So, yeah, yeah. anyone else? Oh, good. Yeah, I have the pleasure. You know, knowing both of you means. Oh, uh, Rob, I, I can't see you, but I can hear you. Um, and I, I love. I Rob is in the process of illustrating the entire novel and well, I mean, <laughs> and interestingly. Um, so. And I love breakfast in bed because that is the payoff of the relationship. Because mm -hmm. is saying, "Oh, he wants breakfast in bed the next morning." There's a little quick. Uh, but the big burning question for me. Bob, that you know, you talk about other stuff. Okay, here you guys talk all night. How do I get that hat? Uh, <laughs> I went online and I'm I'm getting one for Willie and the rest of the crew for the film. Actually, Willie, it gets better. Uh, the hat. I just went online and and found it. There it was. Uh, I can't remember what they're called. Um, but I I there were there was a package of three and i got the picture that they send you now the owner has been delivered and 10 minutes later i got a note from the landlord saying someone got into the house and stole the hat it's like what the hell are they going to do with the ulysses hat? three of them three of them it's like it serves them right those bastards you know for stealing <laughs> I mean, you know, anyone in the room deserves it, but these guys or girls do not. <laughs> yeah. So this, this, you, I wish I'd brought more of these, but this, you know, Pastor, I have them at home, but this is the best, best New Yorker cartoon of Ulysses of all time. <laughs> and you have to see it. I can't possibly describe it. I was thinking about, about those phrases. Yeah, there's spaces. a question when you're ready. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, good. Yes, please. Question? So much. Can you hear me okay? Can you stand up? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Hi. Hi. I to follow up, I think, on Allison's question to Vicki about teaching. I, I was wondering, so if you were saying that you kind of you teach with this idea that at some point it'll it'll click for the students maybe later. But I'm wondering, as someone who's teaching undergraduates right now, how you get them interested in the moment. Like what, what you do in the class for a semester to even just lay the groundwork for that click to happen later on. Well, Vicki, much more equipped than I am. Well, I, uh, <laughs> first of all, I, I, I say that I will fail anyone um, that doesn't finish Ulysses and doesn't read it well. So that, I mean, there's, <laughs> that's the first thing. And um, I try to make that as believable as possible. And then the, the problem with teaching Ulysses, or at least it, it, to that age group, is that for the first two thirds of the semester, I beat them through it. You know, essentially, I'm you know um, listening to their objections. I'm you know pushing forward. I'm trying to tell them you know why it's worth going on, etc. But it's a lot of emotional work for me. This dragging, and then two thirds of the way through the semester, 
they go, oh. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and at that point, they say it's blown their mind. It's changed the way they think forever. You know, they can't believe it. But, you know, at this point, I don't care as much. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that's, um, I don't know if that's unique to Ulysses or not. Um, but uh, it is it is the way it is. Um, you know, they don't want to read it. They, most of them read it because they think they should. It's a, the most important novel of the 20th century. They don't understand why, um, you know, so, and a lot of them are, are really just, you know, showing their chops by signing up. But anyway, it, it is interesting to meet that much resistance for so long, and then to have that resistance just blow up. And I think that's a pretty good description of, of how it works almost all the time. I want to say one thing about my introduction to the Ulysses. I had had a very serious motorcycle accident. I mean, serious, almost as an almost dead uh, motorcycle accident. I was in a hospital in uh, Trenton, New Jersey, called Helene Fool Memorial Hospital. And I had to finish the book and write about it. And I was on, you know, occasional morphine to, because of the, of the accident and the pain. And I had never met anything like this. I thought I was a pretty smart ass guy at that point, you know, senior getting ready to go off to England to school. And I didn't know what the hell was going on. I was an English major. I read, you know, everything I could read. I've been reading for, and where am I? What is this universe? And why is it intriguing me, even though I don't really understand what the hell is going on? Well, it was funny and it was sexy. That much I knew, you know, that much I could get, even in this stupor. Uh, and then Gifford would occasionally come to the hospital and give me a few, you know, guideposts. Oh, the other thing, Vicky and I were talking about this today, modernism. You don't get the narrator saying, look over there, look up there, you know, modern art. Think about walking into the into the modern, the modern Museum of Modern Art as a teenager, you're in high school, and you look at this beautiful mishmash of colors and you think what the hell is that is it, why do they call that a painting and then you begin to you know the more you see of it the more you become uh, uh, acclimated to the language of it to the syntax of it to the nature of the colors and the you know it's just this is a hard book but it's also a great and funny and simple book in that there are these skewers that run through it at least in my head that pull it together So just thinking about um, the conversations about teaching the book and and students' resistance to it or intimidation toward it, um, going to Ulysses Annotated, it the thing that strikes me is such an incredible resource in terms of access. You know, it, I can't really imagine reading the book before Ulysses Annotated existed. Um, it, it very much Im impacted my ability to get through it as an undergraduate student. And so I'm wondering, you know, going back to when you were putting it together, was there a question of access? You know, what, what were the conversations around why the book was important? And, and do you think that has shifted or become more important five decades later? Uh, uh, Don and I, he was teaching it and he needed, he needed to do this. He was so tired of not being able to talk about the book, you know, really just giving a load of fact to it. Um, my experience was different because he he was already piecing together what he thought the book was about. And we then we did it together on some level, although he was always the senior partner in, in this business, of course, because he actually, one, he knew more than I do. Two, he was grown up, I was a kid. He had been an ambulance driver in the British Eighth Army in North Africa. He'd volunteered. He was American. He was a pacifist at that point. And so he just had a wealth of experience. He was ready to read the book, and he knew it, you know, and he also was a very brilliant guy. So, um, and I had great assignments. Go to Lincoln Center Library and uh, Performing Arts and read all the sheet news, relevant sheet news. Go to the New York Public or uh, later at Oxford. Oxford libraries were great. They cared more about the anti-clerical tracks, that is, tracks, it, 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 more security than the pornography. It's like, <laughs> it's really bizarre. Um, 
uh, I did a, a, in the indexes index in this about rhetorical figures. The seventh chapter has just about all of the long, rhetorical figures of Longinus in this great book on rhetoric. And you know, when I, I was you know I was a graduate student, of Columbia, I didn't know anything. But it taught me how to research and taught me how to think about a great book. Maybe the only book I could think about, really. Uh, that's not entirely true. I love portrait. The other, I think, for me, there are two great books. But I, I, did I say portrait? I love Dubliners. Portrait is, I, I, it's not its fault, I don't think, because portrait has been imitated so much since then. I wonder, I mean, almost more than Ulysses, I wonder what it would have been like to read it at the time before all these wonderful, sometimes great imitations, you know, or uh, Weltanschauung stuff, you know, all that stuff. But um, Dubliners is almost flawless. It's an amazing, I mean, do you know that Evelyn, the story about the, the young woman who won't, can't make up her mind, is eight <laughs> pages long? I'm a writer, I can't believe that it's eight. I want, you know, it feels like it's a, a short story. It's not, it's like, how did he do it? How did he do that? I, I don't know. I mean, I really don't know. But uh, he's a very good writer. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I think we might uh, invite folks to continue the conversation downstairs. Sure. This has been wonderful. Thank you so much, Bob and Vicky. Um, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.